Okay, good afternoon and uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to today's national webinar presented by SAMHSA's Game Center with the support of SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And our webinar today is utilizing incentives and sanctions to support successful outcomes in treatment courts. And our presenters today are Karen Calgo and the Honorable Gregory Pinsky, and I will introduce them shortly. But first I'll cover a few introductory items. I'm Dr. Melissa Stein. I go by pronouns she, her, and I'm a senior research associate at Samson Gaines Center and policy research associates. And I'm joining this webinar from Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, you'll see a chat box at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to use that chat box to introduce yourself and share where you're joining us from. Just want to clarify that the views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation and discussion do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Throughout the presentations, if you have questions for the presenters or in regards to the technology, please type these in the Q&A pod found at the bottom of your screen. And at the conclusion of the presentation, we'll address as many of your questions as time permits. We'll also have a couple of polls popping up throughout the event and appreciate your participation. When you see a poll pop up, simply select and submit your response. And you should have just seen a poll pop up right now. Okay, this, this webinar is being recorded and the slides will be shared with everyone who has registered for this event. We'll also notify you when the recording for this event is posted to SAMHSA's YouTube channel. At the end of the event, we will have a certificate of attendance available for download uh, Please note that this certificate is for your personal use only, and we are not able to offer CEU credits. We do have ASL interpretation today. Our interpreters are Pamela Mitchell and Kip Opperman. We also have live captioning. In order to see that, just click Live Transcript CC, and then select Show Subtitles. Just a quick look at our agenda today. We're going to start out with some opening remarks from um, our, our past lead, John Berg at SAMHSA. And we'll also um, move into presentations uh, from our speakers. So first, I'd like to turn it over to John Berg, who is a senior public health advisor at the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment at SAMHSA. And he has some opening remarks for us. John. Thank you, Dr. Stein. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Utilizing Incentives and Sanctions to Support Successful Outcomes in Treatment Court. Thank you for taking time to join us today. I believe that you will find uh, today's webinar very beneficial. SAMHSA is pleased to provide this webinar that focuses on the importance of the use of incentives and sanctions in treatment drug courts to improve client participation and outcomes. A key component of drug courts is the use of graduated sanctions and rewards to encourage compliance. And as you probably know, the fourth standard uh, listed in NADCPs are now all rises. Adult Drug Court Best Practice Standards, Volume 1, is incentives, sanctions, and therapeutic adjustments. Incentives and sanctions are used in treatment drug courts to support or discourage certain behaviors from participants. But not all, not all options have proven to be effective for change. It's important for a treatment court to consider which incentives and sanctions are most appropriate to incorporate in their programming and the ways to utilize them in an effective way. Today, our presenters will share about the many types of incentives and sanctions and ways to appropriately use them within the treatment drug court. Incentives and sanctions, when Im implemented successfully, can lead to increased client engagement, retention, and positive treatment outcomes for participants. In this webinar, our awesome and Great presenters, Karen Calgill and the Honorable Greg Pinsky, will share ways to support the success of drug treatment court clients 
and ultimately the treatment drug court mission. I wanna thank our presenters for sharing their knowledge and expertise with us today about this very important topic. And I also wanna thank the Gaines Center staff for their work in developing and facilitating today's webinar. So at this time, I'd like to turn it back to Dr. Stein. Thank, thank you, John. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Karen Calvo is a project director for the Treatment Court Institute, a division of All Rise. She retired from Maricopa County Adult Probation, where she served as an adult probation officer and supervisor for 20 years, 19 of which were with the DUI and drug court. She also implemented a veterans court track in the drug court program. And she's been the project director for multiple grants, including BJA and SAMHSA awards. She managed the BJA grant to establish a Spanish speaking court for a DUI court program. She has presented at numerous state and national conferences, including the American Probation and Parole Association, All Rise, and the National Judicial College. Ms. Calvo graduated from Southwest Texas State University with a bachelor's degree in social work and completed her master's degree in education leadership at Northern Arizona University. Prior to working in law enforcement, Ms. Calvo served as a crisis counselor in the community and a case manager for the seriously mentally ill. The Honorable Gregory Penske is a retired Montana District George judge. Before taking the bench, Judge Penske taught at the University of Minnesota Law School and practiced law in Minnesota and Montana. As a district judge, he sat by designation on the Montana Supreme Court and served on the Montana Drug Treatment Court Advisory Committee. Judge Penske is an elected member of the American Law Institute and Uniform Law Commission. Judge Pinsky founded a veteran's treatment court and presided over a treat drug treatment court for eight years. He worked with the Harvard Law School Access to Justice Lab to design a comparative study on treatment court processes. And as a member of the National Judicial Opioid Task Force, he authored federal, state, and tribal jurisdictional transfer agreements to expand access to treatment courts. And Judge Pinsky also drafted the Model Veterans Treatment Court Act for the Uniform Law Commission. Judge Penske is a consultant to All Rise, the National Court, uh, Drug Court Institute, Justice for Vets, and Tribal Law and Policy Institute, providing research, training, and technical assistance services to treat reports across the United States. So now you've learned who uh, is speaking to you today. So I'd like to go over who is joining us today. And thank you so much for everyone um, introducing yourselves in the chat. And it looks like a majority of you, 48%, are joining from urban locations, followed by rural locations at 31%. And we do have um, several of you calling in or joining in from tribal lands, such as Reservation, Pueblo, or Alaska Native Villages. And in terms of your agency and organization, it looks like the majority of you are joining from corrections, probation, and parole, which is not a surprise considering the topic today. Um, we're also seeing a number of you joining from the judiciary at 19%, followed by community-based providers at 18%, um, and several others from other organizations. So uh, thank you so much for taking your time out of your Monday after the uh, holiday week to be with us today, to learn with us. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Karen Calvo to begin our presentation. Karen. Okay, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here and talk to you about incentives and sanctions and therapeutic adjustments um, and getting to present with Judge Pinsky. We have a lot of material to cover, and so I'm going to go ahead and just jump in. I want to make sure that you all know as we're talking today that you can go to allrise.org and you can download the standards and that's standard one through 10. There's two volumes and standard four applies to incidents and sanctions. And then also we have a fact sheet on behavior modification. There are also all kinds of training there and you can see all kinds of resources that we have for the field and they're all free. I will say exciting news is that we're updating the standards and that'll be out around December 15th. And the standards were first published one through five back in about 10 years ago. So we've learned a lot more stuff. And so we have more information and standard four will be one of those ones that's updated. So look for that and make sure you download that when that becomes available too, because it's going to give a lot of great information. 
So when we're thinking about ways to reward, punish, or treat, we're going to either give them something or we're going to take something away. And so we're going to talk about that here for a little bit. Judge Pinsky and I are going to try to give you examples of incentives. People always want more, but we will try to give you a few. And there's also examples at allrise.org. So when we're thinking about giving or taking, we have response categories, right? We have incentives, we have sanctions, and then we have those treatment adjustments. And so we always want to make sure, sometimes I observe courts and they say they're going to give a therapeutic sanction. There are no therapeutic sanctions. We're giving sanctions, incentives, or we're making a treatment adjustment. And we're going to talk about each of these categories. So let's talk about rewarding behavior, right? So this is the one that's the most important, and this is the one sometimes we all struggle with, especially those of us in criminal justice, we're used to more on the punishing side. And so we wanna get really good at this. This is the one that's gonna change behavior the most and is really something important that we get right. And so first of all, we give things, we give verbal praise, right? We're gonna say good job, not just the judge, but every team member should be reinforcing telling them what they've done well and giving that verbal praise constantly for every little thing they do, we wanna give them that verbal praise. And then we wanna look at applause. So applause is very important and we wanna do it, but I always wanna give them a note of caution. So as a part of my job with technical assistance, I get to observe courts all over, uh, staffings and courts. And I went to a court a couple of years ago and there was a person who had been absconded and they caught him and he was saw the judge and he was going to jail for a little bit. And they took him away in handcuffs and everyone started clapping. And I was like, what is happening? He didn't do anything and they're clapping. And I realized that clapping had just become routine for when they were done speaking to the judge. And that's not way what we want. We want meaningful interaction, right? So we want applause. We want verbal praise tied to the behavior. So you may say something like, they have, they're promoting from phase one to two. Let's give them a round of applause. They have 90 days sobriety. Let's give them a round of applause. Let's tie it to the behavior. When you say verbal praise, don't just say good job. Say good job or we're really proud of you that you made it to all your treatments. And we want to make sure that we are telling them because sometimes we assume that they know what we're talking about and they may not. They may be thinking, well, what did I do in there? That was a good job. So we always want to tell them clearly, tie it to the behavior, giving that verbal praise or that applause and that they know what they're getting applauded for, that everyone in the courtroom hears what they're being applauded for. They hear the praise and we're giving them that praise and tying it to that specific behavior. We, you also may give tokens, gift certificates, and then we have the fishbowl drawing. So many, many courts use the fishbowl drawing, and I have seen this used in many different ways, and it is really uh, one that works well. And so just consider that some courts say, well, we don't have any money, but there's things that you can put in there that don't really cost you any money. First of all, you can put things in there saying good job or telling them specifically what they, you know, a, positive reinforcement but there are things that might not cost you money that are time so it could be you have long drug testing lines so the one of the things they can draw out of there is go to the head of the drug testing line that's a time thing it could be they don't have to come down to court they can report virtually one time so you want to ask your participants what's meaningful and think about things that maybe don't really cost you money but there's things that are important to our participants those are things that are really important I just saw, I was in a court in Kansas a couple of months ago, and I observed a court that did kudos cards. So I've, I've heard of this, I've seen it, but what they did is they, they had already determined the things that could earn kudo cards. The team knew this, and then team members throughout the week gave out kudo cards for good behavior and things that were promoting recovery. So I love this because instead of mandating support groups, they got kudo cards when they chose to do a pro-social activity or they chose to go to a support group. And then even better than when they came to court, they actually then gave those kudo cards to the judge and the judge talked to them about it. So they would say, oh, I understand you went to the support group. Great job. Tell me about it. So it gave it an opportunity for them to report back on some pro social activity, how the support group went, what they thought. And then they got to put the kudo 
card into a bowl, the fish bowl. And at the end of the court, the judge drew out a name for a gift card. So this was amazing because what? Three different times that person got reinforced, good job, when they got the card, when they put it in the fish bowl, and then for the drawing. So many opportunities to reinforce that excellent behavior of the things that we want to see. So look at ways that you can add and, and provide more opportunities for that. So we want that to be happening because what we want with those incentives is to be having that center of the brain where that releases dopamine and serotonin. When you give them that applause, then they have a release of that. And so that's what we want. We want them to feel that pleasure of being proud and being treated, you know, getting recognition. And that's what's going to cause them to start repeating the good behavior that we want and the behavior they need to have to be able to maintain sobriety and, and enter into recovery, right? You may have things that you're taking away, negative reinforcement. They may have a curfew and you take it away and you make it less. They may have some fees that they're weight and they could have reduced court appearances. Now, a word of caution, this reduced court appearances and reduction of things that's kind of a normal phase progression, right? As we're moving them through the phases, they're going to start doing less. So don't take something away that they need. So for instance, we know that research the in the beginning phases, they need to see the jo judge at a minimum of every two weeks. So we wouldn't want to take away and say, oh, you can come see the judge in four weeks because we know that they actually need to see the judge more frequently. So just be cautious of that, but you can move forward in that. And so really look at how you can reward it and not just the judge, but everyone on the team constantly reinforcing those positive behaviors that we wanna see. When we move on to punishment behavior, we have a lot of law enforcement here, and sometimes we're good at this, or we think we're good at it. We're more comfortable with it, I think. But it's something that we really need to make sure we're using the evidence, the science on behavior modification. Um, we're not doing it sometimes because we're annoyed and we're just wanting to, uh, we're frustrated with them. We want to make sure that we're doing things that are effective and going to actually modify behavior. So really a big one is verbal reprimand or expressing verbal disappointment. The participants really want the judge to be proud of them and so and also the team members that they develop those relationships with so when we express disappointment or let him know that that's not acceptable that can be very effective it's a low a level sanction but it's something that can really impact their behavior um, you may give them an earlier curfew right or you may give them community service and then there's that flash incarceration right so judge pincy's going to talk about this in just a few minutes but I want to remind you that we do not want to be giving a gel for use in the beginning phases, and we don't give gel right away. We're going to wait until we've responded with some moderate responses at least four to five times before we start thinking about gel, because that's the highest level of sanction. And Judge Pinsky will talk more about that, but it needs to be brief and quick when we do use that. Then when we're looking at some response costs, cost, they could have to, they lose some money, right? We're going to take some of their money away, a fine, but be cautious of this because many of our clients that are in treatment courts have are high risk, high need. They have a hard time with getting employment that pays their bills. And we don't want to put something too harsh on them that they're not going to be able to do. Um, another thing you might have is a return to more frequent court appearances. So this one I want to talk about a little bit. Um, we want to make sure that we're not demoting people people back phases. So when I, if I leave elementary school and go to junior high in seventh grade and I start having problems in seventh grade, they don't tell me, hey, you got to go back to sixth grade now because you're not succeeding. They're going to see, do you need a tutor? What else do I need to be successful in seventh grade? They don't send me back to sixth grade. Our participants don't have a lot of progress and they've moved forward in the program. Don't take that away from them. But what you can do is put some of those requirements from the early phases on them. So you may say to them, hey, we're concerned this is not really phase three behavior, so we're going to have you report every week for the next little bit until we feel like you're back in the right direction and you're you're more stable. So you can put some of those requirements on them, but you don't take away their progress and you don't have them dejected or feeling like they failed and lost any progress that they had. So you want to make sure that you look at all of these things when you're thinking about punishing behavior and, and considering what's going to shape this person. When we're thinking about treating behavior, this is the one thing, and I'm going to talk about this a little more in a little bit, but we want to make sure that we 
let treatment people make these determinations. Oftentimes, probation officer, I was probation for 20 years. Sometimes we think we know a lot more than we really do. And you might be really educated about it, but you're not that person's licensed clinician. We only want licensed clinicians making these these recommendations. And it may be they need more treatment. Maybe they need additional treatment. They need trauma groups. They need to go to inpatient. Or as they progress through their program or the treatment will settle and they're like, hey, they can move to a lower level of care. They don't need 101 anymore. And so you want to make sure that the treatment provider is determining, because this is kind of like the medicine. So we want our licensed clinician telling us what medicine they need to get better. Do they need less? Do they need more? And that is always. So we're going to have that treatment response in response to certain behaviors. And then we're also going to have incentives and sanctions to other responses to behavior. Before I turn it over to Judge Pinsky for a little while here, I just want to talk about four crucial elements. Even more important than picking the right magnitude is that we have certainty. If you are requiring behaviors, then you need to respond to every one of those behaviors. If you fail to respond, you're actually responding. You're letting them know that it's not important and you don't really mean it, and they don't really have to do it. That's not something we want to teach them. We want, if we're requiring it, it needs to be something that we respond to. So there needs to be certainty on the participants' part that they know if they do this, they'll be acknowledged for it. And if they don't, there's going to be a, a, a sanction for it. And so we want to make sure that we have that certainty. That is one of the most important important components of this standard. And then that moves on to reliable detection. If you don't know what they're doing outside the courtroom, then you're not able to really give them, you may be applauding them when they're actually doing things that you don't want them to do. I had a court one time who started doing home visits they hadn't been, and they had a DUI court person who was about to graduate, and they found a meth lab at his house. So they had been clapping and telling him how great he was, but he had actually been selling drugs. So we need to know what they're doing outside the courtroom, because if we don't detect it, and we don't have good drug testing system in place, we may be rewarding behavior that we don't want to, or even more importantly, we're not helping them, because we're not discovering the behavior that they need help with. Again, I talked about this, make sure it's associated with the behavior. You want to make sure that they know what you are. This is why we give incentives and sanctions together. You can give them both. We Sanctions, one bad thing doesn't cancel all the other good things that they've done. So judges need to say, and all of us need to say, good job for going to all your treatment for this, for this, but we're going to need you to do this community service because you weren't able to do this. So we're verbalizing to them what they're getting incentives for and what they're getting sanctions for all at the same time, and we're tying it to the behavior. And then lastly is immediacy. We want to make sure that we try to get it as close to the event as possible. It's best practice for teens to have uh, real-time communication. And then after that, when they're communicating and you're responding to their behaviors and you get them into court as quickly as possible, what we don't want is someone four weeks later getting sanctions for something because we've had four weeks of behavior and we needed to address it back when it actually happened. So you need to try to get them into court as quickly as possible, maybe put them on the next week's calendar so that they can be seen. And now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Judge Pinsky because he has a lot of good information to give you too. Thank you so so much, uh, Karen. You know, there's a number of different uh, uh, components that comprise a best practice standard for that go along with implementing incentive sanctions and therapeutic adjustments in your court. The first one of those uh, is the concept of advance notice and the importance of telling your participants in the participant handbook the range of incentives, the range of sanctions, the types of things that they that may happen uh, as a consequence to either desirable or undesirable behaviors. The same holds true for advance notice of your phase requirements. What, what is expected of your participants in, in any given phase? advance notice of what could lead to, to termination from, from your program so that participants uh, are able to gauge their, their behaviors accordingly. And, and along those same lines, uh, telling your participants what's in it for them, letting them know what the, 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 the potential benefits that they could receive or consequences they could receive uh, if they successfully complete or, or unsuccessfully uh, to complete the program. The advance notice concept uh, is critical uh, in that respect. Now, 
advance notice doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to tell your participants in, in the participant handbook that you know for uh, phase two, a second missed drug test will result in the following sanction. That, that ties down too much to, and, and doesn't free you up to have an individualized response uh, to a particular behavior. So allowing yourself, allowing the team a reasonable degree of discretion to modify sanctions as appropriate to, to uh, address a particular behavior uh, is important. I responded as Karen was, was talking to a question uh, in, in the Q&A about how you differentiate the, these issues between participants. How do you uh, either give a gift card to one participant and just applaud for another participant? Uh, or how do you administer one sanction for one participant and, and another? In a couple of slides, I'll talk about the concept of equivalency doesn't necessarily mean identical, but in this, con in, in, in this uh, advanced notice, portion of the best practice standard, explaining to your participants early and reinforcing that throughout their participation in the court that sanctions will be individualized responses. Now, the team will obviously attempt uh, to maintain consistency uh, between similarly situated participants, but allowing yourself that reasonable degree of flexibility is important. Many teams might come up with internal guidelines for themselves to uh, guide uh, their responses to, to particular behaviors. That's fine, so long as you allow yourself, again, that, that flexibility. As an example of that, I, I had a participant in my, in my drug treatment court. He was an 18-year-old male. We couldn't get him engaged in the program uh, at all, couldn't get him to show up couldn't get him to engage and, and really we're, we're at the end of, of our rope uh, in terms of whether the, it was time for termination from, from the program. Went through our entire progression of, of sanctions as we'll talk about here in a couple of slides. And, and before the termination, our, our probation officer had done a home visit, noticed the participant uh, was, was playing his Xbox. And the, the um, probation officer asked the participant how often um, or how long he was playing his Xbox every day. And the participant said something like 17 hours. So the, the probation officer said to me, hey, is there any way we could take away his Xbox and see if that gets him engaged in treatment and in the program? I said, well, this is something we've certainly never done before. And so sure enough, uh, took away his Xbox, told him he'd get it back when he advanced to phase two. And guess who got engaged in the program, started showing up, right? And, and you'll never find, you know, taking away a video game on, on a, a, a sanction or grid that you may have for your program. And so allowing yourself that degree of flexibility to address individualized, uh, individualized responses is, is very important. In addition, providing your participants with an opportunity to be heard is, is equally as critical and, and part of the best practice standard. Due process goes a long way and, and is not, our participants don't give up their due process rights at, at the treatment court door. And remembering that due process is, is simply fair procedures and an opportunity to be heard. A and our participants, while they may disagree with a particular response that we have to one of their behaviors, will feel like the process is, is more fair if they're given that opportunity to explain the particular uh, behavior. They're given that opportunity in court to be able to, to identify the circumstances of, of, of what's going on in their life. Uh, this, this is a, a great opportunity um, to emphasize that the best practice standards recommend that judges spend at least three minutes interacting with participants uh, in, in their court appearances. And this is an opportunity uh, for them to be able to have that interaction, uh, interaction with the program. And, and any time that a participant is given that opportunity to be heard, even if they don't agree with a particular response, they'll at least believe that the process itself uh, is fair. The concept of equivalent uh, consequences is an important component uh, to best practice standard four. Equivalent consequences does not mean identical. 
What it means is that there are participants with similar risk and need levels in the similar phase receive consequences that are equivalent to those received by others who are engaged in the same conduct. Equivalent simply means a similar value, severity, magnitude, or intensity. So what does this mean? And, and how do you explain this? This was one of the questions that, that uh, uh, came across the, the live Q&A a, a few minutes ago. Uh, you explain this to your participants in, in a way that, for instance, you know, let's say a phase one participant uh, receives a verbal warning for missing a probation appointment, whereas a phase five participant in the same week receives four hours of, of community service for missing a probation appointment. The phase five participant says, hey, that's not fair. Uh, John was just up here uh, and he got a verbal warning. The response to that is explaining to the phase five participant that, hey, you, you have already you've been in the program for 14 months. Uh, you received a verbal warning uh, for this back in, in phase one. And now that you have the skills uh, that you've developed the skills that are necessary in order to adhere to a supervision plan, you have the ability to be able to show up for your probation appointments 14 months into the program. So explaining to those two participants uh, why the, the same behavior is yielding different consequences, again, is an important component uh, to maintaining the fairness uh, that we talked about. Using professional demeanor is, is important. And oftentimes in, in trainings, um, you know, folks will kind of scoff at, at this, this slide because um, as, as professionals, uh, we understand appropriate and inappropriate behavior and, and appropriate language uh, to use with, with our participants. Um, but this is, is something that, believe it or not, arises in courts uh, throughout the United States. <clears throat> there was recently, uh, within the last two years, a reported decision um, out of the Washington Court of Appeals. Um, it's a case called State versus Lemke. Uh, the treatment court judge in, in that particular case used extremely abusive, extremely hostile, and outright offensive language to a participant. This was reported uh, to the Washington Court of Appeals. You can find the case, and I'll spare you the language that the judge used um, as it relates to this particular participant, but it was totally inappropriate. And, and there's absolutely uh, no way that anyone, whether it's a judge or a coordinator, a probation officer, treatment provider, whoever, whatever team member it may be, can shame someone into changing their behavior. That's not what treatment courts are, are about. And so you using those trauma-informed uh, skills uh, that, that we've learned so much about is critical in order to be able to affect that behavior modification. Uh, as we sort of colloquially colloquially say um, in, our, in our trainings, uh, if it's something that Judge Lee would say, um, it's not appropriate to say to a participant. The concept of progressive sanctions is important to keep in mind. Having a wide range of responses to particular behaviors is important. Uh, this doesn't just simply apply to, to sanctions, but it applies to, to incentives. It applies to therapeutic uh, adjustments as well. Being able to find the right response to a particular behavior uh, is absolutely important. And being able to tie to that behavior uh, that you're trying to change, uh, as Karen mentioned, um, is of critical importance. So what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to identify what our, our proximal expectations for our participants in any given phase. And along the same lines, what are our distal expectations for those participants? And in, in that respect, remember, proximal is something that someone is capable of performing now. Distal meaning something that takes time to accomplish, takes skills, and is necessary to long-term recovery. So identifying that, that list of sanctions um, in the low, moderate, and high categories so that you can respond to any given proximal or distal behavior uh, is important. 
as, as Karen mentioned, um, on the All Rise website, there is a fantastic publication identifying a wide range of incentives and sanctions in the low, moderate, and high categories. Now, some of those won't apply to your program either. They won't be things that are available to you in your community, or maybe you don't have the resources to be able to, to obtain those. Um, but tailoring a similar list, a similar list uh, for your own program uh, is important. One of the questions that, that came across the live Q&A um, when Karen was presenting was, how do we go about in getting these incentives? And, and, you know, understanding that oftentimes government employees aren't able to, to go get donations. There's restrictions on, on judicial officers and, and judicial branch employees um, from obtaining those donations. Understanding all of that, use other tools at your disposal to be able to obtain those donations. So maybe you have the ability to uh, form a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, that is outside uh, your court, but supports your court to be able to obtain those. Uh, maybe use an alumni group with your with your participants to uh, be able to obtain uh, those types of, of of donations. One of the best practice recommendations for every treatment court is to have a community advisory board comprised of members uh, of different constituencies uh, in your community, and 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 empowering that community advisory board to, to find ways um, to support the incentives uh, uh, portion of your program. Any of those things um, can be ways that, that you can obtain uh, those incentives without necessarily running afoul of, of uh, any uh, ethical uh, restrictions. Jail sanctions are an important component of the best practice standard for a jail sanctions should be used judiciously uh, and sparingly and as a last resort. It's hard to imagine uh, any circumstance under which a jail sanction uh, is a treatment response or a response to, to continued use. Uh, jail sanctions should be a, a last resort at the end of your progression of sanctions. And when you do use jail sanctions, the best practice standard uh, recommends that they be used uh, no, no, no more than three to five days uh, in duration. This has been this has been studied, and 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 there's research that goes behind uh, the efficacy uh, of jail sanctions. When jail sanctions reach the seven day mark, they start to have an inverse effect on recidivism, and of course. Two of our goals of, of treatment court programs globally are to improve upon recidivism and to improve upon cost savings from the traditional uh, justice system. Once you start hitting that seven day mark, rather than having a positive impact on recidivism, you're actually promoting recidivism. There's a 40% increase in recidivism once you hit a seven day jail sanction and dramatically, uh, once a, a, the two-week mark is hit, there is 140% uh, greater increase in, in recidivism uh, with those jail sanctions. And so the concept of flash incarceration works uh, when it is used, uh, when it is used effectively and, and consistent with the best practice standards. One of the important components uh, of, of jail sanctions is due process. And if a participant is facing a jail sanction and that participant denies the underlying factual basis that is giving rise to the particular jail sanction, a due process hearing uh, is required. Uh, what, what does that look like or what does that mean, first of all? Um, I'm not suggesting that any time that you are going to sanction a participant that you need to have a due process hearing. This only applies to, to situations where a participant is facing a jail sanction and they deny the underlying factual basis that leads to that. Now for participant, uh, like, like in any situation, knowingly, intelligently, voluntarily admits to the, to the um, infraction that's going to lead to the jail sanction, you don't need to have a due process hearing. But if, but if that is contested, then you need to have a hearing with basic due process safeguards. And what I mean by that is, you notify the participant why they're facing a jail sanction. You give the participant uh, an opportunity to call witnesses on their own behalf, to cross-examine witnesses, 
um, to be, <clears throat> excuse me, to be able, if they choose to do so, to to explain their their side of of the story. Uh, these are uh, all basic due process safeguards that are inherent in our system. Looks somewhat akin to a, a, a probation revocation hearing, if you will. In, in many instances, and and I'll often receive. Um, comments uh, at, at, at trainings that, uh, well, geez, we don't have time to be able to, to do this type of hearing. Well, first of all, you have time to, to ensure that the constitutional rights are, are protected. Uh, you have time for that more than anything else. But beyond that, I always emphasize to courts that you, you, you need to take advantage of using your courtroom as a classroom. And, and by that, I mean, have a hearing like this at the start of your treatment court session. I'll give you an example. I had a participant uh, in my drug treatment court that was on a, a monitoring bracelet, and, and, and she was tampering with that, that bracelet. So we would get the, the tampers. She would deny it. We went through this multiple times until finally, uh, through our progression of sanctions, we could point where she's facing a jail sanction and, again, denied the tamper. Uh, so what did we do? Well, at the start of the treatment court session, we had a representative from the monitoring company testify about how the bracelet detects tampers, uh, that the bracelet was calibrated, that in this particular instance, a tamper uh, was detected, and the participant was there. Participant had the opportunity to call witnesses, had the opportunity uh, for cross-examination, and the public defender uh, representative from the treatment court team uh, there with her. And, and she, didn't, she didn't do any of that. And so uh, what did we do? Well, first of all, um, you know, I found that she tampered with her bracelet and imposed uh, the jail sanction uh, accordingly. But beyond that, we painted a broader picture, we used the courtroom as a classroom. All of the other participants who were in the courtroom uh, had the opportunity to hear that we can detect tampers and that if you do tamper with, with your monitoring device, there will, there will be a consequence. And if you continue to do that, um, the consequences will become more significant. So we achieve that educational component uh, that we should always look for the opportunity to further uh, in anything that we're doing uh, with regard to, to our programs. This is an illustration of the importance of, of coming up with that, that, that progression of sanctions, if you will, and, and the importance of doing that because Oftentimes, what can happen is when, when courts uh, don't sanction effectively, uh, they can run into habituation effects. So if you've given someone uh, seven verbal warnings for missing probation appointments, um, you're, you're going to have a habituation effect. The, the verbal warning isn't, isn't going to, to do any, uh, isn't going to change that behavior any longer. On, on the other side of the spectrum, if you sanction too too heavily, too early, or, or too often, you're going to hit ceiling effects. So if a participant in, in the first uh, week of, of the program um, is late for an appointment and you pose a five-day jail sanction, what do you have left in your what do you have left in your tool belt? Right? So uh, you hit that ceiling effect where all of a sudden none of the sanctions, none of the progression of sanctions that you have uh, will, will change any behaviors. So staying in that effective zone, that moderate zone of those sanctions is important. This is an illustration of how to develop your proximal and distal expectations. You should really do this for each phase of, of your program and identify and paint a picture of, of what uh, what behaviors someone should be engaging in in those particular phases. Of course, in phase one, uh, what we're expecting from participants is just the bare minimum. Attend, admit, and attempt. In other words, show up and be honest. Those are the bare minimal expectations that, that we're looking for from any one program. We don't expect someone in phase one to be able to abstain from drugs and alcohol or to accept the nature of their substance use disorder or to, uh, to adhere with absolute uh, perfection uh, to a treatment plan or, or a supervision plan. Those are all things that take time to accomplish. Now, of course, as someone progresses through the program and you develop these expectations for your phases, those distal expectations 
will become proximal expectations. So we expect someone who's in phase five to be able to have the skills necessary to abstain, accept, uh, and adhere. And developing uh, these for each phases will guide you in your responses to particular behaviors that occur uh, in a particular phase. In responding, in responding to particular uh, infractions, if it's a, a, a proximal behavior that you're responding to, using intermediate to high magnitude sanctions will be effective. On the other hand, a distal behavior, something that you don't have a reasonable expectation that a participant should be able to do, either a treatment response or a low magnitude sanction uh, is the important uh, category for you to look for in your progression of shins uh, for those particular areas. Karen? Okay, thank you, Judge Pinsky. We're going to get uh, started on talking. I'm going to shift it just a little bit and talk about some staffing considerations. So it's very important that we use staffing to determine what responses we're going to use. Now, I observe courts all over the United States as a part of my job, and I sit in on staffings. And what I often see in staffing is we go down all kinds of bunny trails. We all give our opinion about why we think the behavior happened. We spend a lot of time talking about the behavior, the person, whatever, but then no one really talks about our response to the behavior. And so it's really important that you stay focused and that our, we need all of that team, all of your expertise to help determine what staffing, what response is going to happen when we have this. So you should, you should be having staffing as close as possible to court. And these are the kind of questions that you're going to want to be asking so that you can determine the correct response, right? So first of all, you want to know who they are and is risk need. Um, you know, the target population for most treatment courts, best practice shows high risk, high need, but you need to know that because we're going to respond differently according to different risk and need levels because they're going to have different proximal and distal goals. They have different risk and need levels. And then where are they in the program? Just like Judge Pinsky talked about, we can, you know, phase one and phase five, we're going to have different goals and we're going to respond differently to, to certain behaviors. And then we want to talk about why did this happen? So this is something I'd like to spend some time, just a little bit of time with. And by the way, this slide alone, we have our presentation on, so we could go into so much more detail. And so I'm just going to cover it briefly. But why is important? Because I like to give the example of you have someone, you have two people in phase four. They started at the same time. They are in the same phase. They've been in the program the whole time. And you come up on a weekend and you have Joe who had a death in the family. He reached out to us sponsor couldn't get hold of him and he wound up drinking joe called and left a message with his treatment provider he showed up at probation on monday morning he went to treatment he called a sponsor he went to support groups and he was devastated that he used and didn't handle it well then we have johnny who went to vegas over the weekend went with his friends and drank the whole weekend we caught him on tuesday because we he got packed with an etg test we caught him and after investigation we found out that johnny went to vegas and drank the whole weekend and that was his choice our responses are going to be totally different. In the same phase, they both had positive tests, but we had a completely different responses. So the first person is probably going to get just a treatment response, and the second one's going to get a different response for dishonesty, for not clearly showing that they haven't made progress in treatment, they haven't incorporated the tools that they've learned. And so we really have to know those circumstances to know why and what we're responding to. And then again, which behaviors? Remember, we have to respond to every behavior. And so you want to make sure that you're listing all those behaviors and you're determining whether they're proximal or distal. So if you required it and you told them they had to do it, then you need to respond to that and figure out if that's proximal or distal. And then you're going to move into that, what's the response choice magnitude? So like Judge Pinsky said, we have a list on there, but take time as a team to sit down and look at your incentives and sanctions list and separate them into low, moderate, high, because we don't have to give the exact thing, but we do have to give the same level. This will prevent you from having those favorites and because we have favorites and we have people that are not our favorites and we wind up giving them disparate levels of magnitude but if you have it broken out already then you know okay this is a medium level sanction they need which of these medium level sanctions is appropriate for this person and then 
the thing that I see most frequently not talked about in staffing is how to deliver the response. We need to want, we want to make our judges look good. We want them to have a meaningful interaction with our participant. Supervision, treatment, you know these participants really well. So tell the judge the best way to deliver the message. Help them understand how that person will hear, hear it better. Help give them questions, open-ended questions that will lead to conversation and learning and, and knowing more and developing that relationship and also being able to shape their behavior. So when you have staffing, really focus on responses and how to deliver it and don't spend so much time talking about the actual behavior and then consider do you need changes in treatment or changes in supervision but really you know, I always say if you're starting to go down a trial where you're spending too much time stop look at these questions and see where you've gone astray and then get back on on track so when we're thinking about therapeutic adjustments, a couple of points I want to make is I've already said this, but I want to stress it again. It needs to be recommended and delivered by treatment professionals. And so it's and it's actually important if at all possible to have that person's treatment person, because just because you're a treatment professional doesn't mean that you're that if you're not that person's treatment person, then you don't know what they've been doing in treatment. You don't know the progress they've made. You don't know maybe the challenges or the trauma or the background. So we want that treatment provider to be doing it. I always like to tell judges, you wouldn't want a treatment provider coming in and getting your robe on and getting the gavel and starting court. You would be, there will probably be some contempt in there, right? So we don't want judges, probation, lawyers determining treatment. We want levels of care to be determined by the licensed clinician using validated assessments. And so make sure that we're doing that. We're asking good questions. We're knowledgeable that they're getting evidence-based treatment, but the treatment providers making those determinations. And then, um, Judicial officers, if the person's willfully non-compliant, so they're not participating or they're not attending, and we've already identified any barriers to transportation, and they're just not going, then you do need to sanction that. Because if we don't get them to treatment, showing up in the beginning is the most important thing to them. That's way more important. The responses has to be much more quick over that than an actual use because we have to have them going to treatment. So they should be getting a sanction if they're not going and they're willfully non-compliant with treatment. So making sure that you understand that about those therapeutic adjustments. And then incentivizing productivity. I know I talked a lot about rewarding behaviors, but we really want to make sure that we focus on this and that we really give a lot of opportunities for it. We want to place as much emphasis on making incentivizing those productivity as we do with the sanctions but one thing i really want to talk about and we're going to it, there's a lot more detail in the new standard that's coming out uh, in a couple of weeks but a lot of courts put criteria for progression from one phase to the other as sobriety but we don't look at what actually is going to lead to long-time recovery so we really want you to start looking at what skills do they need to learn and they need to demonstrate that they've got those skills before they progress on so we don't want someone that's just white knuckled 90 day sobriety but they're not showing those connections so what i'm talking about is each phase identify what they need to learn but we want them to learn where what pro-social pro-social activities do they enjoy that bring them pleasure and give them connection to the community do they need support groups do they need maybe a sports club and a hiking club is that something that's going to be church is that going to be more conducive do they have a job can they pay for their bills are they giving back to the community are they connected those are long-time recovery so sobriety is important but recovery and recovery capital is what's going to more likely show success and them not coming back and them not being recidivism. So instead of focusing completely on just sobriety, look for their success, identify each phase what you want them to learn, and make sure that they're being engaged in those activities that are going to lead to that long-term recovery. Because we certainly don't want someone in phase five participating in sobriety activities because we're having them draw from a fishbowl. We should have seen internalized. They should be doing it because they know that that's what they need for their recovery and they're going to have a, a life because recovery is a long time process. And in 18 months to two years that you may have them in your program or even less, they're still in early recovery when they leave you. So you need to make sure they have those connections. And that's what we want to be 
looking at at each phase is have they learned the skill? Do they know how to do this? Do they have connections? Are they connected? Are they giving back? Do they have the safe place to live? Those are the things that are going to contribute to long-term success and sobriety will follow that but we want to make sure that we're actually looking for the gaining of those skills and identifying those in the different phases because that's what's going to actually reduce recidivism when we know that they're connected and they don't need us at the end they're not saying sober or they're not attending support groups or whatever because we're making them they're doing it because that's a part of their life and a part of their recovery so we want to make sure that we do that Again, just make sure that you have realistic, achievable things. Sometimes we put these lofty goals that they don't give a lot of opportunity for them to succeed at. So make something that they can succeed at, make it realistic. Make sure that you ask them if you know what's desirable to them and may, maybe it's tangible or intangible. Um, and so again, just the app opportunity for reward can be meaningful to them, just like we talked about in the fishbowl. So we wanna make sure that we consider that. And, and again, just like Judge Pinsky said, with proximal and distal goes so proximal, um, if they are obtaining proximal goals, you're going to give them a low incentive. So you're going to say, great job. You're going to give them that verbal praise. But if they're able to reach a high level, a distal goal, and they succeeded that, we want to make a bigger deal of that, and we're going to give them a higher level incentive. And so we want to think about incentives the same way we do with sanction on, is this a distal or proximal? It applies for both incentives and sanctions when we're looking at that. So the next couple of slides have a lot of information and I don't wanna read them to you, but there's some important things when you're considering. We always want to get that magic answer. When do we terminate them from treatment court? There is no magic answer to that because there's so many factors that go into that, but we don't, you know, they're only terminated if they can't be safely monitored in the community or if they're just repeatedly failing to comply with treatment or supervision. If you have someone absconding over and over and over again, then you're not gonna be able to get them to treatment and get them better. So if there's that repeatedly failing, then you may have to consider terminating them. But we do not terminate people for continued use if they are going to treatment and complying with supervision. What we may need to do is adjust treatment. We may just need to stay the course for a little while longer in treatment, but we need, if they're still working on it, then we need to remember substance, moderate to severe substance use disorder or mental health issues can take that. It's a chronic, uh, disease, you know, relapsing disease. So we need to have compassion and understand the disease part of it and just support them in the ways that we can and help them as the, as we get them working towards recovery, but we don't terminate them from our program. We'll respond to stuff, but we don't terminate if they're going to treatment and supervision. And then one other thing that I, we always like to point out is sometimes in our, in our communities, we don't have what everyone needs. You may have someone that needs medication assisted treatment. They need inpatient and you don't have those things and they're not going to get better without them. And so eventually you have to terminate them from the program. Well, you want to make sure you don't have an augmented sentence or give them a dis disposition for failing to complete the program because they didn't get better because you didn't have the medicine they needed. So always think about that. If you have someone in your program and you're not able to give them the medicine that they need and think about these things when you're considering terminating someone from the program. And then when you're looking at graduation and termination, make sure that if someone is terminated unfavorably, um, they didn't graduate, they're terminated, they receive a sentence um, or disposition for that underlying offense, right? And just, it should be hard to get out of your program. I said that on the last slide. If there's minimal consequences for withdrawing from the program. It's research has shown that participant and program outcomes are poor because it makes sense, right? Is um, treatment courts are not easy. I would not want to be in a treatment court. There's a lot of demands. We ask a lot of things. And so sometimes they come in because of the legal incentive. And then they're like, whoa, this is way more than I thought. And this is hard and I'm feeling pain and I want out. Well, we don't want it to be easy for them to get out because if you do, you'll have you won't have as good of outcomes. And then as Judge Pinsky talked about advance notice, you need to make sure prior to them agreeing to the program, they understand the range of possible things that could happen and they are unsuccessful in completing the program so that they uh, are have a heads up and they know what could happen if they don't finish it. 
And then also when we're thinking about graduation, we want to make sure that we do give them that biggest incentive of all, right? It's, there needs to be a legal incentive for coming into the program. So what is that? Sometimes people want to tell me they should be grateful that they're getting their life to back. Well, they should, but this is also a court system and we need to give them some kind of benefit, right? So it may be probation is terminated early or they avoid a criminal record, something on the criminal record, they avoid incarceration, but we do need to have those big incentives for them to be able to come into the program. And they need to know that ahead of time so that they know what's gonna happen when they're successful in the program also. So standard four, this is standard four, and it really encompasses a lot that we talked about today. Um, consequences for all your the participants' behaviors, they need to be predictable. So in other words, they know we're gonna respond, right? Like we talked about. Fair, a perception of fairness, that opportunity to be heard, that um, same magnitude, that is one of the biggest responses that they will handle it if they think that the, they're being treated fairly. Consistent, we're always responding and we always know what their behavior is, so we, we're reliably detecting it, right? And then it's administered following those evidence-based principles of behavior modification. So a lot of us are parents and we tried to figure out and we do our best, but there's no handbook, right? Well, we do have a handbook of, on, and research on behavior modification, and this is really taken also on behavior modification on the criminal justice population. So we want to do that, use the science and try to do what's best. So because we're asking our participants to do what? Change every single thing, change it all. So we need to help them. We need to give them all kinds of kudos and we need to be reliable and consistent when we're doing that. And so making sure that we're fair. And as we're going to have questions here in just a few minutes, I just want to remind you that All Rise is a resource for you. We're here to offer resources so that you can have the best treatment courts that can possibly have. We have four branches. We have Treatment Court Institute, Impaired Driving Solutions, and they that's for our uh, DWI, DUI courts, Justice for Vets for Veterans Courts. And then we also now have Center for Advancing Justice. We're looking at how we can look at the criminal justice system from arrest on or even pre-arrest and for those that are suffering from substance use disorder or mental health disorders how we can help them in that and so one of those things that we do offer is this, we have an incentives and sanctions training that's two days long and it's a lot of hands-on a lot of role play a lot of practicing and working with your team on this sign up for that will be coming out in the next few weeks so make sure you're on the all rise listserv sign up for that so that you'll get notified and you can sign up for that training and always reach out with questions through technical assistant at our website and also we have a fantastic e-learning center all the, everything's free, so go there and look at the standards and all the different things that we offer and see what we can help you with your court. And I think at this time, we're gonna turn it over for questions. That's right, so uh, thanks so much, Karen and Greg, uh, for your really informative presentation. And even through your presentation, I saw you answering some of the questions that were coming in, but uh, I'm still gonna take some time to uh, address questions that have come in. And if you still have some burning questions after the presentation, then please drop them into the Q&A. Um, let's see, I'm gonna try to find uh, which one I wanna start with. Um, we do have a few that were already answered in the Q&A, but um, I might revisit them just to give both of our speakers a chance to, to elaborate on them. And so, um, you know, there's been a lot that's come up around readiness to participate, and that's a little bit outside the scope of this webinar, but, uh, you know, we, the truth is we do have folks that come in at various stages of readiness uh, into these treatment court programs. And so I think I would like to give both um, Karen and Judge Kinsky a chance to respond to those concerns uh, around folks that come in and, and seem to not be ready to progress. And uh, I, you know, Karen, I think that you were starting to address some of those comments in your last couple of slides. Uh, but just wanted to start there and give you a chance to respond to some of those concerns and uh, you know how might people leverage incentives and sanctions for folks that don't seem quite ready to participate in a treatment pro program, what, what would you advise? That's a hard question, right? But what we are in the new standards, we're going to have a whole, one of the updated standards is the is one about treatment. And we really talk about letting the 
person, you know, go to the treatment, get their buy-in with it. We because when you have their buy-in, so oftentimes courts have cookie cutter expectations, or this is the treatment you go to, and it needs to be individualized. And we may have to put them in an enhancement group, or they may have to go to one-on-one -on -one treatment for a little while to get them ready and have that interaction so that that. Uh, counselor can work with them, roll with that resistance, right, and help them. And remembering that we don't have to put them on our time frame. We want to acknowledge their struggle and give them what they need to be able to move forward. Because if we don't give that time, they're going to be back eventually. So let's just take time, be patient, and let counseling work with them on how to get them ready so that we can identify that discrepancy and move them forward and talk to counseling about that. Judge Pinsky, I don't know if you have something else to add to that. Yeah, I'll, <clears throat> I'll just add. I mean, when we when we train courts on developing their their eligibility criteria, uh, one of one of the best practice recommendations is that this concept of amenability to to change or or willingness to engage in in treatment shouldn't be part of your your eligibility criteria. Uh, that. Uh, as as professionals, we're we're terrible, uh, really, when it comes down to it, at at um, assessing someone's willingness to change uh, or, or willingness to engage in treatment. We've certainly all seen situations where we have someone who comes into our program, and and maybe we say to ourselves, "Oh, geez, there's there's no way this person's going to complete this program," and yet they do, right? And we have other participants who come to us. Um, and and we feel like they're totally invested from day one that, that that they're engaged in treatment that they're engaged in the in the process of changing people places and things in their lives and, and we feel like they're our model participant but then for whatever reason they're they're ultimately not successful in completing the program we've all experienced uh, that anecdotally with our participants and so you know, making sure that we don't use that as as um, an eligibility criteria to bring folks um, into the program um, is, is important. And and then for those participants who who are not engaged, finding those ways to 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 get them in, in engaged. That's your job. That's the art and science of of incentive sanctions. Uh, and therapeutic adjustments, and and the example that I gave with my video game playing eighteen year old um, is is a living example of of how you have to go about doing that. And sometimes um, maybe you're not successful in it. You reach that point uh, where the participant can no longer remain in the program, uh, but hopefully not. And, and Judge, since you uh, alluded to your example, and that drew a lot of interest in, in chat in, in the chat. Uh, so could you explain more about the process of how you all arrived to a decision to take away that person's Xbox? You know, what was the conversation <laughs> with the participant and, and treatment staff and, and et cetera? Like, you know, what was that process? What did it look like? Well, well I, I'd like to say that the process was very high level, but it really simply involved a uh, probation officer uh, calling me after hours as he was out of as he was doing a home visit and, and said, hey, judge, um, you know, this guy's spending uh, all waking hours uh, on on his Xbox. And boy, maybe, um, you know, probation officer is thinking like how motivated um, his kids are when they lose their video game privileges. Right. I mean, and I'm not suggesting that in a patronizing way, but 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 that was the thought process, right? Hey, mates will work. Like we've tried everything else. We're literally at the point of terminating this guy. Maybe we can motivate him with something um, that that he appreciates, right? And and so the explanation um, to the to the participant was was quite simple. And the the Xbox was there when I, I was just sitting on the bench when I made the the explanation, which was, you know. We really want to help you succeed. We we have invested so much time uh, and and effort in into to helping you to try to motivate you and and we're not succeeding in that. You're at a point where you're facing potential termination from this program. You're facing potentially having 
your probation uh, revoked and potentially having uh, to go to the Department of Corrections. That's not something that any of us wants. We didn't, we didn't bring you into the program in order to see that happen to you. You have so much potential, um, but, but there are things standing in the way of that. And, and the, the only way that we can truly be successful is for you to show up. That's all we're asking in this phase. Phase one, just please show up, show up. And if we can enable you to show up, uh, we'll do that. And one of the ways that we feel like you might show up is if you didn't have this distraction from video games, which, by the way, um, in and of itself can 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 be a form uh, of an addiction, right? So uh, just like we prohibit uh, our participants or probationers from going to casinos, for instance, um, prohibiting this participant from playing his video games in that particular in that particular um, participant's life was something that, that ended up motivating him, right? And and it just kind of came out of the circumstances of what was happening. That's very helpful. And so you said that when you had this conversation, he had brought the Xbox to the hearing, or and so he had advanced notice that there was going to be a conversation about the Xbox, and um, so it wasn't like someone came into his home and took, removed it. Um, any more you want to add there? No, I mean, the participant, look, I mean, the participant knew that he would get his Xbox back at phase two. I don't want to be too distracted by the, the Xbox situation. There's lots of things that we, legal things that we won't allow our, our participants to have. I mean, they, they, they can't have cough syrup, for instance, or, or you know, uh, they obviously can't have drug paraphernalia, any, any things like that, right? So um, in this particular instance, um, not playing the video game was something that motivated that particular participants and aligned with what we were trying to achieve. Well, that's helpful. Um, Karen, are, are there any other examples of creative uh, sanctions or incentives that uh, you, you've heard being used across the country? Wow, that's a big, broad uh, one. I, you know, I've seen, I talked about the kudos cards, I, and kind of in that same realm, I've seen decision dollars where the staff have just give out dollars when they've made good decisions. They showed up to treatment, they did things that were well, and they can save up those dollars and then they can go into kind of like a pantry and they can um, shop in there for things typically like Tide detergent, uh, fem feminine products you know, formula, things that they might actually need for their family. Those are really good. Um, the thing about those is you need to make sure the team's determined what will earn them because we have a variety of personalities and some people are stingy with them and some people are not. They give them out for everything. So we want to make sure that people are get, being treated fairly when we're doing that. Um, really, I've seen, I've seen, I saw one court where as each person promoted, because, you know, we, we used to see that before and after picture, and it was kind of shaming to the person when they graduated, they were embarrassed to see their, you know, photo of when they get their booking photo. I had a court, um, and I can't remember, it was just in the last couple of months, I, I think it was in Arkansas, but they uh, take a picture of the person every time they promote or if they got recognized for a job in court, they took their picture. And then at the end, they give them a photo book of all their successes while they were in the treatment court. And I thought that was really impressive because it helped the person get something tangible to show them all the times they did things well, that they were able to succeed at a lot of stuff to be able to finish the program. So the the uh, one of the attorneys just took it as their job so every time something big happened in court they had them pause and they took their picture obviously they got permission from the participant but um that actually was very impactful i think and when they graduate they have that memento so i thought that was one that was very really reinforcing of all the positive stuff that we do um there's so many different things on there you know that we can do but um uh, that's just a couple that come to my mind thank you that's helpful um, there have been a couple of questions about just even getting started, and so I did want to just have one uh, one opportunity for you to respond and, and maybe provide some tips on, uh, so a, a treatment court program that's brand new, how do you get started in creating incentives and sanctions, and, and uh, Judge Pinsky, uh, you know, 
for presenting some really helpful information about uh, you know creating some for each phase, proximal and distal um, incentives and sanctions for each phase. But um, it, so Karen, I'll start with you. Any other advice or suggestions for treatment courts that are just getting started? You know, how can they set up an effective incentives and sanctions um, uh, uh, continuum? Well, I mean. There is training. I would get training because it is a lot. I mean, even a lot of us have been doing it for a long time, but I think you really do have to have know your target population first because if you don't know them and you don't have good validated assessments, you're not going to be able to make good decisions. But then those phases are really important because you want to have realistic expectations. And once then you move on, then look at the list online, sit down and talk to your team, develop a list of low, moderate, and high incentives, reach out for help and ask people to help you. And you have to have that list of incentives and sanctions broken out. And then you have to know the clear expectations. What are the goals for each phase? And then how you're going to present those to everyone and what they can earn with each phase. So it's really a policy and procedure. Reach out to other courts. There's examples everywhere. We always say case, copy and steal everything. So that's the only time stealing is allowed is to copy other programs, reach out, go to the National Drug Court Resource Center. There's examples online of different policies and procedures that may have it and reach out to other teams. And you can always reach out to allrise.org and, and ask if there's training specific for your team to maybe be able to help you. I'll just add uh, add to that that you know frequently um, you know we receive questions uh, when we're we're doing trainings along the lines of of resources um, we we don't have money to be able to buy uh, incentives okay that's that's frequently heard from from courts around the country you don't need money in order to have effective uh, incentives and and I'll tell you that one of the best things that you can do is to engage your participants in developing your incentive program. So you can do that in a number of ways. You can do that through an alumni group. Uh, you can do that through uh, exit interviews. If you don't conduct exit interviews of both your successful and unsuccessful participants, uh, you should do so. And, and All Rise has some sample exit interview uh, questions and forms that you can use in order to do that. But you'll get exceptional feedback on on your uh, on your incentives, and so uh, as an example of that, uh, I visited uh, I visited one court where the most desirable incentive that that, that this court offered uh, was what they called a front of the line pass, and and in this particular community. Um, everyone who was connected with the justice system, the abuse neglect system, uh, they all drug tested at, at a central facility. And there were times where people had to wait in line for a half an hour in order to be able to provide uh, a, a drug test. And so um, every week the court uh, put all the names into a, a drawing of the participants who had fully compliant weeks and they drew out a name for a front of the line pass. And the participants loved that. And, and so any time that you can, you can engage your participants to find those desirable incentives, it will motivate uh, the behaviors that, that, you're trying to, that you're trying to encourage. Any time, as I alluded to answering one question um, in, in the Q&A, any time you can structure incentives or sanctions around time, that is going to be an effective way to address behaviors. Put it in context of your own life. If you have a situation <clears throat> where someone wastes your time, you're very irritated, uh, you're frustrated, you're going to avoid that situation in the future because you don't want your time wasted. On the other hand, any time that you have a situation in your busy day where you've been given back an hour of time uh, for something that, that, that didn't happen that you expected to, um, it, it's like a blessing on your day, right? This is equally as true for our participants. Anything that we can do if they're engaging in undesirable behaviors to impact their time, by human nature, they will work hard in order to be able to get that time back, okay? Incentivizing them by, by giving them time in little ways, like this front of the line pass that a court used, um, is a way to promote desirable behavior. So, if you can structure your thinking around time, you'll be on the right track to, to developing these types of um, incentives and sanctions that work. 
Thank you. That's so helpful. Um, and now kind of jumping to a, a question more for courts that are established, and Judge Pinsky, I see you already answered this in your chat, but again, just wanted to revisit this. And many, many court programs might meet every other week and not have um, immediacy when responding to um, some, someone's uh, behavior. So um, how might a court deal with immediacy when they only meet every two weeks? And so, um, Judge, since you answered in the chat, I'll start with Karen, but I'll still circle back to you for additional comments you might have. Okay. Oh, so now you're going to set us up to see if we answer different, but this is, <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of touchy. First of all, you're not going to be in a vacuum, right? The supervision's responded, treatment's responded, you're letting them know what's going to happen. You've asked the team what to happen. And so if you can bring them in sooner, that's better. But if you can only wait to the two weeks, then you just are going to ask the team what should happen, if it can wait till court or not, and then you'll respond and let the participant know. Um, there's no perfect answer in this, because we are a court system, but we certainly wouldn't want it to go more than the two weeks. Um, I don't know, Judge Pinsky, do you have more opinion on that? Uh, it, it's critically important that no matter what, that participant reports to court the follow at, at the next regularly scheduled uh, court session, even if they're not scheduled to appear, uh, they they have to be there for for the delivery of that sanction. Now there's there's certain times uh, with with certain programs, um, as I explained, where the team is very cohesive. They're constantly communicating between the court sessions. Maybe it's a low level, a low magnitude. A response. Maybe a participant, um, you, you know, was late for a, a treatment appointment, and so the treatment provider wants them to write an essay on the importance of of timeliness, and this gets circulated among the team, and and the judge is aware of it, and so the participant gets started on that on that timeliness essay, and then they report to court at the next regularly scheduled court session, and the judge then says, "Hey, you know, you missed this treatment." Uh, or you were late for this treatment group, I understand, um, you, you know, you, you were asked to write an essay on timely, timeliness. Uh, why don't you read that essay to us now, right? So the participant knows that that, that consequence is, is coming from the court for one, uh, but for two, you, you continue to use your courtroom as a classroom, uh, as I alluded to earlier. Thank you for that. And uh, we also, um, this might be our last question because it might get a little bit of, um, may require a little conversation, but uh, um, we, we've we covered the, the, the need to, to not terminate people due to substance use, but there's also questions around demoting people from phase to phase. And so I wanted to revisit that a little bit. So um, in, someone asked, please say more about why phase demotion is not recommended if a participant is consistently demonstrating phase one behavior now, even though they were promoted to phase three based on previous behavior, why wouldn't a demotion be appropriate? And so I just wanted to kind of revisit that with both of you and, and get your thoughts on that. Um, the judge, you responded in the chat, but also just um, if you want to kick us off and just that uh, you can repeat what you've written or add to that. Um, uh, you know, what are some comments around phased emotion and, and, and uh, responding to people appropriately? Sure. Uh, phase, phased emotion um, is, is, is not recommended under the best practice standard uh, because it, it's demoralizing, it is uh, stigmatizing, and it can have adverse effects on the participant's recovery. When, when someone has, has accomplished a phase and you've promoted them, they have met the benchmarks that you've set for that particular phase, okay? And, and, and you've promoted them to the next phase where you have a new set of, of benchmarks and objectives for the participant uh, to achieve. And in that context, if, if relapse happens, which is expected, right? Relapse happens, your response is, is a therapeutic adjustment. Your response is, uh, if that happens in phase four, for instance, to, to have the treatment provider uh, do a new assessment and, and, as indicated, engage the participant in whatever level of treatment is necessary to be able to, to address that particular relapse, when all of a sudden demote someone down to, to phase two. 
our faces are structured also in most instances, by the way, to to address relapse or non-compliance uh, that happens within the context of that particular phase. From a research standpoint, uh, the the research uh, researchers have identified a co uh, concept called uh, abstinence violation effect, and 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 the citation, the research, or in the comments to the best practice standard. But essentially, uh, what that means is is that when someone with a substance use disorder, when they experience a relapse after a, a period of abstinence and, and they're motivated, uh, then they uh, may conclude wrongly. Uh, that they've accomplished nothing in their treatment and they'll never be successful at their recovery and and making those uh, them take steps backwards uh, does nothing to further that overall uh, uh, long-term recovery that you're trying to achieve. And Karen, what would you like to add to that? Well, I would just agree with him. And, and sometimes it can be, you know, they've had the relapse or they've started demonstrating some criminal thinking and they're not complying, then maybe we need to add a criminal thinking class. Look at what services we're not providing. If they're messing up, we need to provide the services they needed and look at that. And so, yes, this is a chronic relapsing disease, they may have, they're going to take steps back, but we don't demote them. We look at what they need. Flu treatment is fluid. They can go backwards and forwards on what they need. So maybe they need criminal thinking classes. Maybe they need uh, more treatment. Maybe they need trauma group. Maybe they need different responses. We're going to respond with appropriate court responses. And if they're needing, you know, if it's a goal, they may be getting moderate level sanctions if it's not related to substance use and it's, you know, they're not attending or something. But we don't want to do that demoralizing and we don't want to discourage them. And there is no need to. We want to address the goals of what they need to meet there and help them be successful. And we don't need to take away what they've succeeded at. Um, again, they haven't had very many um, successful things and we don't lose things when we move forward in school or in whatever, we don't get set back. We just have to deal with what's happened in that phase. So again, I would just say, don't be shocked that they start demonstrating other behavior. Um, just roll with that and see what they need. Do new assessments and see what's happening. Are they? Do we need to change case plan goals? Do we need to change treatment plan? What needs to happen? Thank you for that. That's, that's really helpful. And um, there was some requests around what are some what are some of the research behind that, uh, Karen? So maybe there are. Uh, would it be fair to say there's there will be some citations in the updated standards. Absolutely. And for those of you who want all the research at the end of the standard, the current one and the one that's coming out, there are a list of all the research behind it. And you can, you know, there's a lot of visual that want to read all that. So please feel free. It's all going to be at the end of every standard. Okay, thanks, Karen. All right, so we're at the end of our time for the Q&A. And um, there are a number of questions still uh, that we were not able to get to. So uh, we'll have some contact information coming up if you want to reach out to the game center and we can also um, potentially link you with Karen and, and other resources. So you should have just seen in the chat that uh, Ashley Sabatino dropped a file for the certificate of attendance. And so um, uh, that should still be pretty low on the chat. Uh, I think we're going to pause chat so that you all can see that. And um, click on that and follow the instructions that your computer gives you to download that to your computer. Um, uh, so that is your certificate of attendance. And Ashley's putting it in the chat once more. And uh, you also should have just seen a closing poll pop up where you can provide more feedback around other uh, helpful um, resources or uh, potentially even future webinars that the Game Center will work on. And I just want to say thanks so much to Karen and Judge Pinsky for their time today. This has been so educational. I, I can only imagine how helpful the two-day training is if this was, there was so much information in one hour. Um, so for those of you who have so many questions that weren't answered, really look into the two-day training with All Rise. Um, uh, but thanks so much, Judge uh, Pinsky and Karen, for your time and expertise. Uh, it's just been incredible. Thank you. Thanks.
And we do have a couple of upcoming webinars here at the Gain Center in December. I know it's a busy month with holidays and um, time off, but here we have a couple coming up around mobile crisis and um, technology solutions for those of you looking for um, technology options for sharing and partnering um, and sharing data and information. We can move to the next slide. If you're not um, signed up for the Games Listserv, you can enter this shortened URL into your browser, and it'll take you to the page where you can sign up for our Listserv. Uh, you could also um, use this QR code to get to that web page. Next slide, please. And finally, if you have questions and you would like to reach out to the Games Center, uh, here is our website at the bottom of this screen, as well as our direct toll-free number. Feel free to reach out to us. Um, we'd be happy to connect you with resources or help you find answers to your questions. Uh, for those of you who had questions that weren't addressed today, uh, feel free to reach out to us here at the Game Center. We'd be happy to help you out to find more information. So. All right, well, we are at the top of the hour. So thanks again, Karen and, and Judge Pinsky, and um, everyone have a great afternoon. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.